today is the uh, 8th, 8th of October, 2023. There is um, an automobile show, if you guys are interested, on Bergen Line Avenue. Oh, I'm going after. There you go. <laughs> All right. See if you are interested. All right. So we're going to start. Uh, we have sent the Book of Judges, chapter 1. Verses 22 to 36. Um, I'm going to start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here one more time. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share your word, dear Lord. Give us your wisdom, your ability, your strength to do just that. And let it be a blessing to the people who are present and people who are watching on video. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, the book of Judges, of the chapter 1, this is the third part. Uh, as we know in the past lessons that uh, Joshua dies and uh, the Israelites take over, but nobody had a leader. And then Jacob allowed the 12 sons <clears throat> a portion of the land. So for, uh, let's say, Joseph was allowed this, for Zebulun was allowed this. So the 12 sons had their own territory to conquer. And they are responsible to displace the Canaanites, you know, tot totally and take over the land. But none of them did that. They kind of compromised. They kind of uh, not do away with them, but defeated them and put them to hard labor. But that's like having a, a, a servant in your house that is no good. It may influence, and that's what happened, one by one. Okay? So keep that in mind. This is the third part of chapter one that involves how people compromise with the Canaanites. So keep that in mind, and uh, it's going to be a lot of names here, but that's the main idea. How are you doing, Hi, Robert? <clears throat> so I'm going to read from, uh, <clears throat> so bear with me with these names. <clears throat> Verse 22, now the tribes of Joseph attacked Bethel, and the Lord was with them. When they sent men to spy out Bethel, formerly called Luz, the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, show us how to get into the city, and we will see that you are treated well. So he showed them, and they put the city to the sword. That phrase, they put the city to the sword, that means they kill everybody. Mm. Uh, and it's, but they spared the man and his whole family. He then went to the light of the Hittites, that guy, when he built the city and called it Luz, which is his name to this day. But Manasseh, that's one of the sons of uh, Joseph, did not drive out the people of Bethshad or Tanakh or Dor or Iblem or Megiddo and the surrounding settlements, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. Now, the Canaanites are the enemy. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, again, but never drove out completely. Nor did Ephraim. Ephraim was the other son of Joseph. Drive out the Canaanites, living in Gezer, but the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Near the Zebulun, Zebulun was another son of Jacob. Drive out the Canaanites, living in Kitron and Ahol, so these Canaanites live above, above them, but Zebulon <coughs> did subject them to forced labor. Not did Asher, Asher is another one, another son, drive out this living in Atko, or Sidon, or Achlab, or Akzib, or Helba, or Abhet, or Rehob. The Asherites, the Asherites uh, are the enemy, they live among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land because they did not drive them out. Near the Naphtali. Naphtali is another son of Jacob, you know, there are 12 sons. <clears throat> there are those living in Beth Shema or Beth Anna. But the Naphtalites, too, live among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land, and those living in Beth Shema and Beth Anna became forced laborers for them. The Amorites, that's the enemy too, confined the Danites, Danites from the tribal of Dan, to the hill country, not allowing them to come down to the plain. <clears throat> and the Amorites were determined also to hold out in Mount Heres, Ajalon, and Shablim, Shabim. But when the power of the tribes of Joseph increased, they too were pressed into forced labor. The boundary of the Amorites was, was from Scorpion Pass to Sela and beyond. Now, remember, all these names that I mentioned are the sons of, of uh, Jacob. There were 12 sons of Jacob. And like I said, each one was allowed a portion of land. You go there, travel the Canaanites, take over, and that's it. They did not do that. They didn't drive them out. They compromised. They uh, defeated them, but they put them to forced labor. So there was like a cancer living between them. And they influenced them, all of them, 
okay? So they compromised in their, in their, and eventually, of course, they committed sin. They adopted the religion of these people, the, uh, the customs of those people, that child sacrifice and all that, and of course, terrible consequences. So let me start with uh, <clears throat> verse 22. Evelyn, verse 22, please read. It says, Now the tribes of Joseph attacked Bethel, and the Lord was with them. Now, Joseph had two sons, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. So the tribes of Joseph were Ephraim and Manasseh. This may be a generic reference to the northern tribes as a whole, in contrast to Judah, who are more limited reference to Ephraim and Manasseh. The tribes descended from Joseph's two sons, and whose pivotal achievement was the capture of Bethel. So their mission was to capture Bethel, that uh, city. The action now centers in central Palestine. Bethel means the house of God. It was located just north of Jerusalem. It was an important town in the religious history of God's ancient people, beginning with Abraham's first sacrifice to God and Jacob's revelation from God there. Joshua had captured the city, perhaps as part of the, first, the defeat of Ai. Ai was a city that Joshua conquered. Now, Bethel was, was famous or was notorious in the, uh, in the history of Israel because it goes back to, uh, to Abraham, goes back to Jacob. <clears throat> so it was a very important city. Let's read verse... What does it mean? Hmm? What does Bethel mean? Bethel means the house of God. There's a bakery in Manhattan. It's called Bethel. Oh, yeah? Bethel, yeah, they're Christian. Okay, that's good. Um, I, uh, I delivered these uh, auto parts to this place, the Korean place, and uh, it's called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Yeah. And I told the Korean guy, Emmanuel means God with us. Yeah, yeah. All the Koreans are the Christians there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, they are, I, I go to Fort Lee and all that. I mean, it's full of Koreans. And all the churches are also, not only, I mean, it's great to see them, you know, and they're very, very religious. Okay, uh, verse 23 and 24. Um, Wanda? <clears throat> when they sent men to spy out Bethel, formerly called Luz, the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Show us how to get into the city, and we will see that you are treated well. Now, if you recall um, back in the book of Joshua, when they're trying to conquer Jericho, they send the spies out, and they contact Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute, and uh, she believed in the God of Israel. And she said that, uh, I know that you, God, is the true God, so I'm going to help you out to conquer this city on the condition that you spare my, my and my family. And they did that. So when relating this particular event, it's a similarity to that place, okay? So here, for example, uh, they, they see a spy. I mean, they, uh, they saw a man coming out of uh, Bethel. So the target of this campaign is identified by the Israelite name as Bethel, or Canaanite name Luz. The exact location of this city is uncertain. Luz means deceit or perversion. But Jacob had changed his name to Bethel many years earlier after his encounter with God there. The similarity of this event with the account of the conquest of Jericho in the book of Joshua is, you know, it, it's uh, very prevalent here, suggests that the tribe wished to repeat the earlier event. They sent out a surveillance team to spy out Bethel or Bethel. So they made contact with that ordinary citizen. In this case, a man coming out of the city. They request a person's help. In Jericho, the spies needed a defensive <clears throat> help from Rahab. But in this case, they need an offensive assistant. So they wanted to be escorted into the city. Verse 25. Nico? <clears throat> so they showed them, and they put the city to the sword, but spared the man and took their family. So... <clears throat> so the offer, the offer, the 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 the, the uh, Israelites offered the guy a reward if they helped him. So the nature of the reward is not specified. This particular agreement and the commitment was made to Rahab, but it's totally different because, like I said before, Rahab believed in the God of Israel and believed that He was a real God, and that's why he she helped those spies. So in this case. Uh, there is no call for testimony or identify with Israel. I mean, the man who led the Israelites into the city has no relation to, to the, the true God. And uh, there was no demands made on man. So let's go to verse 26. Uh, Romain? <clears throat> he then went to the land of the Hittites, uh, where he built the city and cut it loose, 
where uh, which is its name to this day. Okay, the uh, the name Luz. My mother was named Luz. Luz in Spanish is light. Okay, uh, but in in Hebrew, I guess means perversion. What a difference, huh? <clears throat> so the city is conquered. However, unlike Rahab, whose family is fully integrated into Israel life, uh, faith and life, the traitor, I mean this particular guy, according to, to the Canaanite point of view, is permitted to live and build his own city and continue his life as a Hittite. Technically, Luz Bethel was conquered. But in reality, the city was simply transferred to another site. So the land of the Hittites, that's located in northern Syria. Archaeologists have unearthed a great Hittite kingdom in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, dating from about 1800 to 1200 BC. However, the relationship between the Hittites of Canaan and the Hittites of this discovery is unclear. So the new city functions as a symbol of the Canaanite in the midst. So they, they allow this city to survive, even though the people there were subject to forced labor. But they're still there, you know? You don't have the enemy in your midst. So the link between this text and the, and the Jacob accounts in Genesis suggests that uh, the author of this, of this book sees a uh, significance to the present event. The city Ephraim conquers was claimed long ago by Yahweh and the Patriarch. So the city is kind of being retaken. This was where God appeared to Jacob. If you recall, Jacob was uh, running away from his brother Esau. And Jacob erected a pillar to commemorate the encounter where he built an altar. And he named Bethel the house of God, and where he had buried his dead. In Israelite tradition, Luz was already a sacred site. The present event is perceived as a retaking of an ancient claim. Some, somehow, the, the author of the book of uh, Judges is claiming things that already had taken place in the book of Joshua. However, while the physical Canaanite town is obliterated, the spiritual Canaanite Luz is allowed to continue. The Israelites had no idea of the dire consequences this compromise will bring to them. Again, you know, if you allowed the enemy to live in your midst, when God specifically said, dispossess them, destroy them, and you don't do that, it's same with Saul, the uh, first king of Israel. When God told Saul, eradicate these this, uh, people completely. But he did not do that. He let the king survive. Let uh, the animals, you know, and all that. So he didn't obey completely. So obedience, obedience is better than sacrifice. All right. So let's go to uh, verse 27. Albert. But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Beth, Shan, or Tanakh, or mm. Dor, or Igun, or I'm saying that right now, uh, Meg Megiddo. Megiddo, and their surrounding mm. settlements, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. Okay, this is what we said before at the beginning of the lesson. They start compromising. They do not do what God tells them to do. Okay? Disobedience. Now, uh, what Jesus said, how do you love? If you want to love me, obey my commandments. So loving God is not uh, emotional. It might be emotional, but it could be, it's a decision that you make. Okay? Uh, and it's very simple. Obey the commands. That's how you love God, you know? Um, it might be emotionally involved too, but not all the time. Love, love is 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 a uh, is an action to be taking. Okay. Okay. So Manasseh did not drive out the people. So here begins a long record of disobedience that began with the Israelites failed to uproot the Canaanites. The failure resulted in much grief in the years following. Of course, besides the tribe of Manasseh, the other tribes of Benjamin, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, Adan also did not do as God had commanded. We see throughout the book of Judges the effect this had on Israel's life. The people turned to the gods of the Canaanites and abandoned the Lord. Moreover, the Canaanites were determined to stay there, to dwell in the land, and rely on their superior weaponry to intimidate the Israelites. Yet, the difficulty could have been removed had the Israelites exercised their faith more completely. So the failure of the tribe of Manasseh to fulfill <clears throat> the divine mandate is summarized by listing a series of unconquered cities in their respective dependent territories in an narrow strip of land, exceeding, extending from the Jordan in the east to the Mediterranean to the west. We have Beth Shan, Tanakh, Dor, Ibleam, and Megiddo. 
as a result the Canaanites continue to live in the land that's a big mistake and they remain there for a long time verse 28 uh, Evelyn <clears throat> when Israel became strong they pressed, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor but never drove them out of completely now Israel is uh, as a whole all the all the 12 uh, sons of Jacob but referring Israel in this verse the author generalizes the Manasite experience to the entire nation. This verse implies that occasionally the Israelites were able to assert themselves against the, and over the Canaanites, but instead of destroying and dispossessing them as per divine charge, they enslaved them. So they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, means they forced the captives to work as involuntary and pay with labor, the slaves. David, Solomon, and other kings continue this practice. Again, you know, the Israelites enslaved the Canaanites in many. So the mistake was made at the beginning was continue eventually because sometimes you don't want to give up cheap labor you know remember when the, the Israelites when when in were in Egypt and then they left Egypt they you know it's a lot of cheap labor that you don't want to give up when the Nazis were in power and uh, they conquered lands they have all these people forced labor you know they didn't pay them anything they just worked them to death you know and that was terrible so it's a uh, it happened so many thousand years ago and it happened you know just a hundred years ago all right verse 29 um, Wanda now did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gaza but the Canaanites continued to live there among them okay Ephraim is the uh, other son of Joseph the target city Gesser was located in the southwest corner of the Ephraimite allotment west of Jerusalem he guarded one of the most important crossroads of Palestine, where the east, west, and north and south road intersected. Here, the Ephraimites also permitted the Canaanites to live in their midst. So they're repeating the same mistake over and over. Verse 30, Nico. Never did, never did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living to Ephraim or Nahalo. So these Canaanites lived among them, but Zebulun did subject them to forced labor. Now, Zebulun is another of a uh, Jacob's son, the descendant of Zebulon, failed similarly to dispose of the Canaanites from the target cities, Kitron and Nahalon. Instead, they permitted them to live among them, enslaving those elements of the population they were able to subdue. Again, you know, you, <coughs> you, you allow them to live with you. Uh, but that's not always bad, you know. <coughs> in the New Testament, you read that uh, in Caesar's household, there was a lot of servants. And some of those servants became Christians, and they were influencing other people there. So having servants in your midst is not always bad. Depends who the servant is, you know. And uh, Paul, he was a prisoner, and he was chained to a guard on, I guess, a six-hour shift or twelve-hour shift. So that guard, but he was allowed to talk to people. So that guard was witness <laughs> of whatever Paul was saying to other people. Say, so can you imagine? Those guards also became Christian eventually. So it's not, you know, whatever your circumstance is, you can always uh, preach the gospel. <clears throat> Verse 31, um, Romain. Nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon or Hanab or Axib or Helba or Aphek or <coughs> Rebo. Okay, the Asherites failed to con conquer the cities in their allowed territory again, seven of which the cities are named here. Verse 32. Um, the Asherites lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land because they did not drive them out. So making the people of conquered lands to force labor instead of driving them out completely produced a significant shift in the description of tribal fortunes. Instead of the Israelites dispossessing the Canaanites from the conquered land, now the Canaanites will remain as a default population obeying the will of the Israelites. The tribe of Asher could not gain the upper hand. Verse 33, um, Evelyn. Neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath, but the Naphtali flights to live among the Canaanite mm. in inhabitants of the land, and those living in Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became forced laborers for them. So in the same way, <coughs> the Naphtalites found themselves living among the Canaanites having failed to drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. 
which the name means house of the sun god. So they're all pagan gods. And there's Anath, which means house of the goddess Anath. Verse 34. Uh, Blanda, Blanda? <clears throat> the Amorites con confined the Danites to the hills, not allowing them to come down into the plain. So the Amorites are the enemy. The Danites are from the tribe of Dan, which is another son of Jacob. So the Amorites, the name comes from uh, Akkadian war, meaning Westerner, West from the Babylonian perspective. Amorites live in the hill country of Canaan, and at the time of the Israelite con conquest. The Danites, they're the, from the tribe of Dan. This tribe assigned Grant consisted of a small strip of land along the Aijalon Valley. This verse knows that the, the, the night, the night failure to make any inroads in the lowland region have been rebuffed by the resident Amorites. So Joshua had defeated the Amorites earlier, but they were still strong enough to withstand the tribal of Dan. For this reason, a large number of Danites migrated northward a short time later. So they were weak, those uh, tribal from Dan. Verse 35. And the Amorites were determined also to hold out in Mount Heres, Aijalon, and Shadow. <coughs> but when the power <coughs> of the tribes of Joseph increased, they too were pressed into forced labor. So the local Amorites forced the Danites back into the hills, retaining control over Ajalon, which is about 20 kilometers west northwest of Jerusalem. Shalbim, a Mount Heres, which means mountain of the sun god, and was probably the, the best Shemesh in Judah, which is very similar, which was also called Shemesh, which meant the city of the sun god. But not all was lost for the Israelites. When the power of the tribes of Joseph increased, they took advantage of the Danite weakness, apparently taking some of their allowed territory and enslaving the native population. So when the, uh, the other tribes saw that the Danites were not strong enough, they put them aside and took some of the territory and enslaved the population. Verse 36, um, Romain. The boundary of the um, Amorites was from Scorpion Pass to Sela and beyond. So the boundary of the Amorites, the southern territory, Amorites are the uh, enemy, eventually was fixed along a line that was called the Scorpion Pass, the farthest point on the southern border of Judah, southwest of the sea, to Sela, which is a city, site unknown, and beyond, up into the hills. So here in the first, this is the end of the first chapter, and the, it shows how the Israelites did not obey completely the Lord's command. Now, the second chapter is going to be the first judge. Okay? Uh, God designed a form of government of judges. Not one person, but a, maybe one or two judges. And it was a theocracy. Okay? But they wanted a monarchy eventually. They wanted a king. So during the time of judges, which was a good thing, people still did not obey the judges. Okay, and it still went from bad to worse, and they still adopted the uh, bad things of the Canaanites, and they still did uh, like a child sacrifice. And, and we're gonna see as you go further into judges how the prey they got, the Israelites, it's like a uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, and then after all that, they wanted a king because everybody has a king, we want a king. And Samuel was the last judge, and uh, God said, Well, you know. They're not reje re rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So they want a king, give my king. And then comes the kings, which are Saul, David, Solomon, and the division. Okay? So this ends the first chapter. We're going to see the first judge next chapter. You have any questions? No question. Um, you said the Bethel place that they're conquering was um, is the house of God. So why do they have to conquer it back? What happened? So what was the was the place of the, the house of God, or? but the house meant, meant uh, that's a god, a pagan god, uh -huh. that the Canaanites had given oh, them. Oh, their god. Oh, yeah, okay. their god. When you're talking about gods, oh, it's okay. a like a sun god. They're all pagan gods, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a, a, a definition of what the, the, the city meant. I understood it was Bethel that was named by Jacob when he saw the angels going up and descending. Yeah. The place yeah. Where he built an altar. It was called. It was always a place of God. Not yeah. It, yeah. Uh, it was called Luz before. No, but it's the, the 
from the beginning Jacob put an altar there and made called it Bethel. And they be, be, but the Canaanites called it something else, but call it loose, God, right? God's place it has always been. Yeah, God's. I got it mixed up. Yeah, he called it was not only Jacob, but Abraham put an altar before Jacob. Mm. And then after Abraham came Jacob. Also yeah, so that was very uh, was important. There was some history about it. Mm. That, yeah, it was very important that place for the uh, Israelite history. What did Abraham do there? He uh I believe he bought a a cave in Macbella where he put the uh, his uh, his uh, dead. I think the Hittites were over there. Uh, in fact, it's right here. Abraham, what did Abraham did? Okay. Um, It says here in verse 26, this was where God appeared to the fleeing Jacob. Where Jacob had erected a pillar to commemorate the encounter, we built an altar, and he named Bethel, Bethel, the house of God, and where he had buried his dead. The Israelite tradition was already a sacred site. The present event he pursued. Okay, the, uh, Abraham, I believe, was the one who bought the cave of Machbella, where he bought it from the Hittites to bury uh, his dead, uh, Sarah. And then eventually, also Jacob buried there, uh, Leah. Okay, so it was way back, but it says here, let me see. Okay, here, uh, verse 22. Bethel means the house of God. It was located just north of Jerusalem. It was an important town in the religious history of God's ancient people, beginning with Abraham first sacrifice to God, and Jacob's revelation from God there. Joshua captures the city. But I believe Abraham was the one who purchased the cave of Magdalene in that, in that place. So it has a, a history. The city of God was, like uh, you said. Uh, so this was the place where Abraham was told by God to leave his father and mother. No, before. no. No, but Abraham was. was told to leave his people and told no, this is not where the place where Abraham lived. He was already on walking. I mean, he was already on the pilgrimage, and he came to this place. Okay. But that's after God talked to him to leave. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was Ur, or Ur, Ur of the Chaldeans. That's where he lived, and he left there. Yeah, but this was another place where he eventually got there, and. Uh, uh, it, it was famous because he bought a cave in, in that place. And uh, so it was very important for Abraham and Jacob. And they buried there. Now, uh, Rachel was not buried there because Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. And she, she was buried on the road. Okay, But Leah, I think, eventually was also buried in that cave. I don't know if uh, that cave exists at this point. Or they know. Because if you go to Israel, a lot of places... When Constantine was emperor, they built a lot of churches, Catholic churches around there. So nobody knows really where uh, where where uh, the sacred sites are, are located. So some scholars emphasize not the burying but the altar that was built. So it kind of signifies the importance of altars. You can have an altar to God or an altar to the devil. But this is a place where the uh, the an altar was built to worship God, first by Abraham. Then the place was already holy. That's why when Jacob lived there, he, he had a visitation right. from God. So that uh, kind of signifies the importance of altars. They are places which are holy. Can you say that? I guess the altar was like a, a worshiping God. Worship God is, uh, I mean, that's a, a physical... Uh, resemblance of worshiping God. Anything else? But did um, Abraham's people ever live at that Bethel place? Abraham's people? Become, yeah, why did it become, why, why is, how it come that Canaanites were living there and that they had to conquer it? Well, they were already kind of living there already, even when even Abraham, Abraham did not take over those places. Oh, okay. okay, he was just passing by. 
I in fact, think it's when they went to Egypt. They all oh, went to Egypt. But they lived there so before, they are, right? They lived there before. They yeah. all went to Egypt, so their land was yeah. occupied, and now they are coming back to the temple. Now, when they went, Abraham had Jacob. Mm -hmm. Jacob had 12 sons. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Joseph goes to Egypt, okay? And becomes second, yeah, second to okay, Abraham. Yeah. And then all the Israelites go to Egypt, mm -hmm. and they stay there 400 years. And then they go to the wilderness, and they said, now go to the promised land after 40 years. And that's where we're talking about. You know, Jacob had 12 sons. Each son was allotted this. You're going to go here, 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 here. And all of them, in their quest of, of conquering the promised land, they compromised with the people living there. And those people were already, for 400 years, God had given them a chance to repent. And they did not. So this was like a, an execution, you know? I mean, they've already been judged. Mm -hmm. They should be eliminated. I mean, there was no bargaining here. So he said, go on there, eliminate them. But they did not. Right. They compromised with them. And so that's what they influenced them. If they didn't go to Egypt, they would have just been in that place and the, the land would have been theirs. They, didn't, they would not yeah. have needed to conquer anybody. Yeah. Well, they, they, uh, there was they a promise. Grown there, there was a there. promise exactly. that God gave to the Israeli people to give to the promised land. So they are the ones who left the promised land and went to Egypt. Mm -hmm. But they were not. They stay settled there instead of going back to their home. But they were not uh, Israelite. Jacob was changed the name from Jacob to Israel. Mm -hmm. but the, so, they, so they were not. Grew. They were so not. They would uh, have grown within the same place. No, they were not ready because uh, it has to be a sequence. First it was Abraham, Jacob, and then the 12 sons. Yeah, it had to be a history. It has to be also going to Egypt been there 400 years as slaves and then liberated from there and then the conquered land. So it was not that uh, they just stay there. They would have to fight by alone, you know, the, the Canaanites. And the Canaanites were, were given 400 years to repent mm -hmm. and they did not. Yeah, so ca ca the, Canaan... The reason they left is because there was, because Joseph was in Egypt right. and there was like no food around there so Joseph asked all of his family. Right. Jo Jacob and his sons, they ran out of food. So they had to go back to Egypt to get food. That's, mm -hmm. that's when they started moving. When they left the, the land. Yeah, well, when Jacob made aware to his sons, to, the, to the, his brothers, that he was Joseph, mm -hmm. they said, okay, you owe my father and you come here. Joseph. And they were giving the best land in, mm -hmm. in Egypt, Goshen. We can't blame Joseph. No, because at the beginning, no, God had already spoken to Abraham about it. At the beginning, that <laughs> they're gonna leave and yeah. they're gonna come back. Yeah. No, we oh. blame Adam and Eve. Part of God's <laughs> Adam and Eve. <laughs> so, uh, so when Joseph and the, the Israelites were in Egypt, they were given the best land, Goshen, yeah. but they were very good for a, for a, at the beginning. But then Joseph died, and the Pharaoh died, and other mm -hmm. kings and pharaohs did not know Joseph, yeah. and they saw the the Israelites or the Hebrews as a threat and they enslaved them and all that. Okay, so that's what happened. All right? All right. Okay, so I'm going to close this with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to uh, be here one more time. Thank you for uh, allowing us to share your word. Uh, let it be a blessing the rest of the day, dear Lord, and also the rest of the week. Thank you, Lord, for taking care of us on a daily basis. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hi. Good morning.